Today on Cook's Country, we're cooking in cast iron. Julia and Bridget share the secrets to perfect skillet pizza margarita. Adam reviews the best cast iron pans with Julia, and Ashley makes Bridget the ultimate chocolate chip skillet cookie. That's all right here on Cook's Country. From the Han Dynasty to the ancient Romans. From the English monarchs to the American cowboys. Cast iron pans have been used for more than 2,000 years. What's made them so appealing throughout history? Well, they can be used for everything. They're searing, braising, and baking. Sauteing, flambéing, and frying. Now, George Washington's mother loved her pan so much, I love this. She put it in her will. <laughs> but over the last century, our cast iron pans have moved from the stovetop to the back of our cabinets. We've heard a lot of people, you know who you are, and they say that they only use cast iron for cornbread. Mm -hmm. We've forgotten how versatile this pan is, but today we're rediscovering the magic that is cast iron, starting off with a skillet pizza. If you want that perfect restaurant-style pizza crust at home, crispy on the outside, soft and chewy in the middle, well, you got a few options. I want one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can build your own wood-burning pizza oven. Mm. You have one at home? No, I wish. No, I don't have one either. Or you can invest in a pizza stone. Or you can pull out your trusty cast iron skillet. That's what we're doing today. Big cast iron skillet pizza, really crispy bottom, great toppings, very simple, but it all starts with the dough. Now this is two cups plus two tablespoons, or if you want to be more accurate, 11 ounces of bread flour. We're using bread flour because we want some gluten formation. This is going to go right into my food processor. And now a little bit of yeast. This is one and an eighth teaspoon of instant yeast. And a little bit of just regular table salt, three quarter teaspoon. I'll go ahead and give this a whirl, just about five pulses, just to mix all these things together. Next, we've got a tablespoon of olive oil for some richness. I'm gonna put the lid back on, and I'm gonna turn the machine on, and I'll add three-quarter cup of water. This is heated to about 110 degrees. Now, it doesn't have to be warm in order for that yeast to rise, but it does give it a little head start. I'm gonna let that mix until it comes together. That's gonna take about 30 seconds. So you can see it's formed a dough ball, a couple scraps in there, that's fine. We're gonna let this rest for two minutes and then I'll let the machine whirl again for another 30 seconds. That's to ensure that we've activated enough gluten. Whee! <laughs> it is fun to watch that go around. <laughs> I'm glad it's not me. <laughs> I wanna lightly flour the bench here. There we go. Take out the big ball. Now, if the dough was super sticky, I would have just added about a tablespoon more flour to the food processor and let it run for another 10 seconds or so. I'm just gonna give this a quick knead. Really, I want the dough to come together and become smooth. Maybe up to a minute of hand kneading is all that's needed. Get it? <laughs> this is looking beautifully smooth. I'm just shaping this into a nice taut ball. And now I've got a bowl that we've greased with a little bit of olive oil. I'll go ahead and coat the top of the dough, flip it over just to make sure it's all coated with that oil. That way the dough does not dry out. And we're gonna let this sit here right on the countertop until it's doubled in size. That's gonna take about an hour and a half. Sounds good. Time to make the sauce. Mm. So we're making a very robust but simple tomato sauce. No cook. Oh, I like that. Super easy, but we want it to have the right texture. We don't want it to be too thin. It'll cause the crust to be very, very soggy. And we've got a 28 ounce can of whole tomatoes packed in their juice. Now we want to get rid of this juice or at least strain it away. We might need some of that a little bit later on. Place them in our food processor. We're going to add a little bit of oil. This is a tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil, some good flavor there. Two minced garlic cloves. A little bit of red wine vinegar for some ping. <laughs> Just a teaspoon will do ya. And a teaspoon of dried oregano. Now we're gonna let all this whirl together in the food processor until it's nice and smooth. Only gonna take about 30 seconds. There we go. Mm. Nice and smooth. So now I'm going to go ahead and pour this into a two-cup measuring cup because we want two cups of sauce for our pizza. 
And you know, a lot of people ask us, what's the difference between using dried herbs versus fresh herbs? And in this sauce, we use dried oregano. Well, we have a very good answer for you. If you want to use fresh versus dried, the ratio is three to one. So if you have three parts fresh, it's one part dried. And in terms of which herbs to use, we like dried herbs that are hardy, such as oregano or thyme. But herbs like parsley or basil, we prefer to use those fresh. Now we want two cups in total, and this is actually going to make more than just one pizza. So I'm going to add back enough of the tomato juice to this to measure two cups. Oh, very smart. Now let's give this a quick stir. There we go. The sauce is easy as that. I'm going to go put it in the fridge. Now it can stay in there for up to a week, but it can also be frozen for up to one month. Our dough has risen nicely. Oh, it has. Doubled in size. And we're just about ready to roll it out. There you go. You can get a better view now for mm. your poking pleasure. I had to do it. <laughs> I love just seeing how well the dough has risen. And you do that by pressing it. And if your little divot in your finger doesn't bounce back, the dough is risen. Now it looks like a bowling ball. <laughs> <laughs> Come on over to the stove. Now here's a 12 inch cast iron skillet. So this is two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. And I'll give it a good brush all over the bottom. And it's quite a bit of oil. We actually want it to start to fry that crust Ooh. a little bit. There we go. Let's get back to the dough. I'm gonna go ahead and turn this out again onto a lightly floured countertop. I can always add more flour if I need to. Pretty, pretty dough. Now this makes enough dough for two pizzas. So I'll take a bench scraper and just cut it right in half. There we go. I want to save half and we can have it at another time. So I'm going to wrap it in plastic and just put it off to the side. I'm going to start to roll this out to an 11 inch circle, patting it first. Now it will snap back a little bit and if it starts to fight me too much, I'll just put a piece of plastic on it and let it sit for another five let minutes. Let it have a timeout. Exactly, that's what it is. It's a dough timeout. You go in the corner, mister. <laughs> so I'm going to use a rolling pin now and start working it out. And it's a rustic pizza, that's my excuse why it's not gonna be a perfect circle. That is always my excuse. This is actually pretty sturdy, so I'm gonna go ahead and lift it up. We're gonna move it over to the cast iron skillet. There we go. Drop it into the pan. And now I'm going to press on the sides just a little bit, just to move it up. Now we're gonna top it with tomato sauce and we're using a half a cup of our tomato sauce per pizza. This actually was a hard lesson for me to learn, how restraint on the pizza sauce when you're making a pizza. You, you learn the hard way. You start with too much, the pizza gets soggy, it doesn't get crispy on the bottom. A little goes a long way on pizza. A little dab will do ya. So sauce on, now cheese. And oh, we're yeah. using whole milk fresh mozzarella. So this is 12 ounces, enough for two pizzas. We've sliced it into quarter inch thick slices. And you can see that's a pretty naked pizza. Mm -hmm. That's no problem. The cheese is going to melt just a little bit, but a lot of that sauce is going to be exposed in the oven and really caramelize and concentrate in flavor. Now we're not gonna go ahead and put this right in the oven. We're going to give it a head start right here on the stovetop. I'll turn the burner to medium high and we're going to let this cook right on the stovetop for about two to four minutes and that's going to give the bottom a head start. I'm going to look for the edges to start to get just set and you're going to see the pizza puff up just a little bit before we head to the oven. And if I peek under, I can see that there's some nice color Ooh, right under gorgeous. there. This is ready to go into a 500 degree oven. It's gonna stay in there until the whole pizza is nice and set and also golden brown. So that's gonna take about seven to 10 minutes. Mm, bye bye pizza. Oh, it smells like pizza. Oh, it does it look like pizza. This is ready to come out of the skillet. Always wrap the handle because it's super hot. So I'm gonna take an offset spatula and just loosen the bottom. And then I'll tilt the pan and just draw it right out. Hoo-wee! Now we just need a last minute flourish of some chopped basil, mm. about a tablespoon per pizza. That makes it the classic pizza margarita. That's the right. The fresh mozzarella and the basil. And I've got a big old pizza wheel here to cut right through that hearty crust. Oh. I love it when you pick up a pizza pizza and it doesn't flop over so all the toppings fall off onto the plate. All right. Be careful. It's hot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so good. The flavor of that dough is terrific. Mm -hmm. I mean, store-bought dough has nothing on this. And you saw how easy it was to put together. Yep.
So move over, pizza stones. The cast iron skillet is here to cook your pizza pies. Start with a traditional pizza dough. Then make a quick no-cook sauce by processing whole canned tomatoes with garlic and dried oregano. Push the dough into the corners of the skillet before adding the sauce and topping with whole milk mozzarella. Give the crust a head start on the stove top so it gets a nice golden bottom. Then finish the pizza in the oven till golden. That takes about 10 minutes. And there you have it from Cook's Country, a superb recipe for skillet pizza margarita. Enameled cast iron skillets sure are pretty, but the real question is, are they worth the money? Well, Adam, what do you think? That's an interesting question, Julian. We have addressed it thoroughly. Now, you know that we love cast iron, but it requires a little bit of extra care. But putting an enamel coating on that cast iron is a way around that care. We gathered this lineup of five different skillets. The price range was between a low of $48.90 up to this $180 guy here. Mm -hmm, but he's pretty. But he's super pretty. The cooking tests mirrored the same test that we did with traditional cast iron, but we added some abuse testing that was all designed to show us the durability of the enamel coating. So we banged on the corners with metal spoons, we cut in the pans, we scraped in them with metal spatulas, and we even created thermal shock. We heated them up in the oven and plunged them into ice water. Most of them survived it without a scratch. This guy here got a couple of little cut marks from the chef's knives, but that was about it. In terms of the stick resistance, we had mixed results, and it depended on really what you were cooking and how much fat was involved. That was the key. So if you are searing really nicely marbled steaks or shallow frying breaded chicken cutlets where there's plenty of fat involved, the food browned beautifully and released without a hitch. But when you get into foods that are sort of notorious for sticking, like fish, like scrambled eggs, like skillet cornbread, was a great example of this. In all of the traditional cast iron skillets we tested, the skillet cornbread developed a beautiful golden crust and plopped right out of the pan when we turned it over. In four of these five enameled cast iron pans, the pan actually held on to a chunk of the crust, so the loaves ripped and came off with a big hole in them. Oh, wow. Now, we tested the conductivity and the heat retention, and we found that the enamel coating doesn't really affect that. They heat up just the same way. But regular cast iron can go into a screaming hot oven or even under the broiler. It's indestructible that way. These pans, with their coatings, a lot of them have maximum temperatures. They can't handle the super hot temperatures because the coatings will develop little tiny cracks called crazing. Bummer. And in fact, this one here has a recommended maximum temperature of just 400 degrees. Oh, that's not high enough. Not high enough, definitely not. In the end, we came up with two cast iron skillets and an answer to our question. If you're not up for the extra maintenance of a traditional cast iron and you have the money to spend, there are really good enameled cast iron skillets to buy, and this is one of them. This is the Le Creuset Signature 11 and 3 quarter iron handle skillet. It's a beauty, but this one's expensive. It's $180. Okay. In terms of the cooking test, right on its heels was the pan in front of you. That is the Mario Batali by Dansk. 12 inch open saute pan. That one cooked nearly as well as this $180 Le Creuset, and that one is just $60. All right, so there you have it. If you're in the market for an enameled cast iron pan, you have two choices. You could spend the big bucks and go for the Le Creuset, or save some cash and buy the Mario Batali from Dansk. So what's better than a chocolate chip cookie, you might ask, and I'll tell you, it's a huge chocolate chip cookie, one that's super gooey in the center and crisp around the edges. I mean, what is not to love? So, speaking of love, I'm here with the lovely <laughs> Ashley, who's going to show us how we can fall in love with a big skillet cookie. That's right, it's a big skillet cookie, and it's all made in this 12-inch cast iron skillet. And it's easier than your traditional chocolate chip cookies. You don't have to deal with scooping, portioning, rotating multiple sheet pans in the oven. It's all done here. Plus, the bottom and the tall sides of the cast iron skillet are gonna make for a really crispy crust. Mm, sounds so good. Yeah, so what we're gonna do is we are going to start by melting nine tablespoons of unsalted butter, which I've gone ahead and started right here. And we're gonna cook this over medium heat until we start to smell a really good nutty aroma. And there's gonna be some bubbling that starts, and once that starts to subside, we're gonna know that this is nice 
nice and brown. It's hard to see browning butter in a black cast iron skillet, so I have a couple tips for you. Throughout this process, I am gonna be stirring constantly just to ensure that nothing's burning in the skillet, but using a white-tipped high-heat rubber spatula, I can just drag my spatula through, and once I start to see some specks of golden brown, I know that it's pretty close to done. Or what you can do is use a regular old dinner spoon, and the same concept there, you're just gonna drag your spoon through, and once you start to see the brown bits at the bottom of the spoon, you know that it's time to pull your butter because it's gonna be done relatively quickly, about five minutes total. As you can see, we've got those browned bits. Lots of flavor. So to stop this from cooking, I'm gonna remove it from the skillet and transfer it to this bowl here. Mm, and you can really see that browned butter in there now. Yep, and it's just gonna give that really nice toffee flavor. We have three remaining tablespoons of unsalted butter that I'm gonna add into here just to stop this from cooking. I'm gonna whisk these together. So you're cooling down the butter? Yep. Those three tablespoons of butter are just about melted. I'm mesmerized. It's like watching a butter merry-go-round in mm -hmm. there. Whee! Yay! <laughs> I'll go on this merry-go-round any day. Me too. Here we have our sugars. I'm gonna add this into the butter mixture. Three quarters of a cup of packed dark brown sugar. Half a cup of granulated sugar. Two teaspoons of vanilla extract. And one teaspoon of table salt. I'm just gonna whisk this together for about 30 seconds until nice and smooth. Okay. Now the remaining ingredient here is one whole egg plus one egg yolk. And the extra egg yolk is gonna provide extra moisture again and richness. Mm -hmm. I am just going to continue to whisk this for 30 seconds until nice and glossy. And then I'm gonna let it sit for three minutes and that's gonna to help to dissolve the sugars. It's time to re-whisk our sugars here. I just wanted to explain quickly why I'm doing this. So it's gonna be a total of 10 minutes that I'm gonna be whisking on and off for 30 seconds. Now we get pulled away, as you know, quite often in the test kitchen for different types of tastings. Doesn't matter if you're baking something or have something on the stove, you gotta go out and taste. Mm -hmm. So this recipe was developed when we went out for a tasting, got back in the kitchen, went back out for another tasting, Hence, 10 minutes had gone by, and it turned out that batch of chocolate chip cookies was the best one yet, and we found that it was because the sugars had a chance to dissolve. I whisked that for 30 seconds, and I'm gonna wait three more minutes, two more times, Okay. and then it's gonna be a total of 10 minutes. Gotcha. It's been 10 minutes. It's amazing how much lighter in color it gets, mm -hmm. too. Here we have one and three quarters cups of all-purpose flour and a half a teaspoon of baking soda. And just whisk this until combined. And I'm gonna add this into our sugar bowl here. We're using that rubber spatula I was using earlier. I'm gonna combine this without over mixing until just combined. You know, it's always a good idea to do what Ashley did and add any chemical leaveners like baking soda or baking powder directly to the flour and whisk it together before you add it to your butter and sugar mixture. Here you can see we have some chocolate chips. Now this is one cup, six ounces of semi-sweet chocolate chips. And the important thing here is you wanna measure and weigh your chocolate chips for this recipe. And that's because they can sink to the bottom of the skillet if you're using too many of them and it's gonna scorch the bottom of your skillet. I'm gonna add this here and mix this until just combined and no flour pockets remain, which will take about one minute. And there are no more flour pockets remaining. I'm just gonna wipe out any leftover butter that might be in the skillet. Can you hold the bowl for me oh, while sure. I transfer that in? Thank you so much. Now using this rubber spatula, I'm just going to carefully flatten it into a single layer here. That's a big cookie. Oh yeah. I have a 375 degree oven that's been preheating. I'm gonna transfer this and let it cook for about 20 minutes until the top is nice and set and golden brown. Then I'm gonna rotate the pan halfway through cooking. Ooh. Oh, the whole kitchen smells like cookie. And heaven. As you can see, the top is just set and it's golden brown. And just around the edges, they're starting to pull away from the pan. So that is perfect. Now does this have to cool down? 
It does. It okay. does have to cool for about 30 minutes. Okay. So I will patiently wait. But you're so right about that crisp edge. You know, I think cast irons kind of make everything that you make in them even better. You can make so much in a cast iron pan. And there's a really rich history behind cast iron cookery. And for more information on cast iron history, go to our website. It's been 30 minutes and we have waited. I've waited so long and it's still a little bit warm. Nice mm. and warm. Using this bench scraper, you can also use a knife. I'm gonna cut this into some nice, healthy wedges mm. for us. And by healthy, she's referring to size. <laughs> <laughs> One for you. Mm -hmm. If I look in here, you can see how moist that is. Mm -hmm. That means that is really going to be nice and soft and chewy but it's very crisp around mm -hmm. the edge. Now, no forks and knives because it's a cookie. Oh yes. <laughs> Butterscotchy, toffee. It really does have that butterscotch taste. Absolutely, so chewy. You know, one thing I hadn't even thought of, big cast iron pan, you put the cookie dough in it, it stays in the oven for a longer period of time than little tiny individual cookies. Mm -hmm. So we're getting this amazing, crispy kind of topping too. Lacy topping. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is so good. I bet this would be great for a party. You could actually make it into a happy birthday cake. Too. Oh yeah, put a little icing on top. Mm -hmm. Our cast iron chocolate chip skillet cookie proves that sometimes bigger is better. To build a cookie with deep rich flavor, we start by browning butter in a cast iron skillet and use two kinds of sugars, using more dark brown sugar than granulated for toffee flavor. After adding an egg and an extra yolk, we alternate whisking and resting the mixture for a total of three times, which allows the sugar to fully dissolve and bake up with a chewy center and crisp edges. Flour, baking soda, and chocolate chips are mixed in. Then the dough is patted out and baked right in the cast iron pan until golden brown. Finally, we cut the giant cookie into wedges, and there you have it, a super easy, super tasty, and super big cast iron chocolate chip skillet cookie. And you can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our testings, tastings, and selected episodes at cookscountry.com. Backslash, backslash, giant cookie. <laughs> Thanks for watching Cook's Country from America's Test Kitchen. So what'd you think? Leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make or just say hi. Now you can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. Alligator. <laughs>